We'll go ahead and turn over to uh, Acts chapter 22. So this morning, you know, the roads are a lot clearer and a lot drier. There was a little bit of ice on the sidewalk. Yesterday I drove by the building here, and our parking lot was an absolute skating rink, just absolutely covered with ice. So I was really glad when I drove up this morning, and it still wasn't. Uh, but we still needed a little bit of salt, and I couldn't find the salt. And one of the things about moving back to Texas is that I lost my favorite sidewalk ice melt, you know? Uh, I know that in, in Texas, this would sound like an odd, your favorite sidewalk ice melt. You have a thing like that? Listen, when you live in New York, that's like having a favorite rub for your, for your brisket. You know, you, you, you know these things, okay? Prestone makes the, I don't get paid for this, uh, but Prestone makes this wonderful ice melt that you throw it out on the sidewalk and it, and it just melts all that like like that I mean by the time you walk back down the sidewalk spots are already open it's amazing stuff and I love it and I miss it and then I didn't have it and this morning when I walked out to the truck and uh, the, the girls had beat me outdoors because I forget things all the, I'm, I'm Dagwood but I'm Dagwood that runs back into the house and back out again three or four times only people over like 80 just know what I just said. I realize that Dagwood is even my own generation. It's like, what? <laughs> Google it. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I run back in the house back and forth for all of the things that I forget. I told somebody this week, if I ever, uh, ever lose my memory and things like that, uh, I, I, it's not for me, unlike most people. Uh, I, I, Tanya won't be able to tell. That's the problem. Most people can tell, and it's it's hard and it's sad, and it's it's one of those to me. It's one of those things of hope that those people who have struggled with that regain all that. You know, the Church of Christ. Use, I'm going to come back to the ice in a minute. The Church of Christ. We used to teach a lot, and I don't know why or where that came from. That when you go to heaven, uh, you won't have a memory of anything that happened here. And I wonder how they thought people knew what to sing about around the throne of God. Not only will we know, and they said, well, but we can't know where we might cry about some of the things that happen. No, Jesus will wipe away all tears. Amen. But we will know. We will gather around that throne, renewed in our knowing of all we ever knew, of all we ever celebrated, of all that God ever overcame in our life, and we're going to sing. We sang great this morning. We're going to sing even louder and better and with more joy and understanding then. Some of the things, though, we'd like to forget. And one of those happened this morning. So this morning, I go outside. I'm back in the truck, by the way. This morning, I go outside, and the girls have already beat me there. I run back in. get Actually, I had to go back in and, and, and get that. I don't know why. But you know, what, what is it there for? And uh, I already know what's on that paper. The... Uh, <laughs> but I went back inside to get it because, you know, Linus Blanket is the paper there, I guess. And when I come back out, they're still standing in the same place at the garage door. And they're at the edge of the garage door. And they're looking at, they're looking at the ice that's on our thing. Only it didn't look like ice. It looked like snow, but it was ice. And it was right there. And they're right there. And I'm like, but the truck's over there. Why aren't you in it? And I thought, you know, the engine would already be running and all that stuff and defrosting. And no. And they said, well, we, it's, it's slippery. I'm like, yeah, it's slippery. Go to get the truck. You know, get in the truck. And they, they put it, but it's slippery. I know it's slippery. I said, all you got to do is ski down it. <laughs> now, hey, who, who was that? Was that you? Now, we have sisters over here pointing at each other. <laughs> Y'all already figured it out, didn't you? Okay, here's the problem. James and gravity. Dolly Parton has a wonderful song called Jesus and Gravity, and gravity is all about humbling you. Mm, might as well be Jesus and James and gravity because that's what happened, okay? And so, yeah, I walk out there. I said, all you got to do is ski down it. It'll be fun. And Emma looks at me like, no, this is not happening. And, and, and for her, it didn't. But for me, it did. And so I start going down. I start skiing down this little slope. And I mean, you know, it's like four, five feet. It's not like a lot. And it's maybe, you know, a six-inch drop. It's really wimpy stuff. And so I'm sitting there going, it'll be no problem. And these shoes... I thought these shoes, they were on, when I googled good shoes for getting up on the roof, because I need to do that, because I've got a little leak around the chimney that I need to fix, and it suggested these shoes, a whole bunch of roofers said that they grab onto metal roofs, which is not easy, don't go up on the roof with just any old shoes, and they said, no, these get great traction, and they all lied. 
They all lied so that they could see non-roofers fall off roofs. I think. I think that's what the deal is. Because I ain't going on the roof in these shoes. They're going to have to Google something else. Anyway, I get out there and I start to ski down this slope and everything's going great. And there's a split nanosecond where you think back to all the memories of all the times that, that, you, that you skied, which for me was once, okay? I only ever skied once. And it was okay. The whole time, I loved it because I skied once and I never fell down. I didn't fall down. I skied in the mountains of, of Massachusetts, which are low mountains, okay? But, but I skied and I did not fall once and I was so proud of myself until today. Until today. Because it's embarrassing to tell somebody you were skiing in, in, in Central Texas and fell. You know, I really... First off, they think you're lying about skiing in Central Texas to begin with, because they're smart. Anyway, so I, I go down this thing, and all these memories are going, and then I get to that one wrong memory. So when we were in Russia, yeah, the other day, so my stepmother said, doesn't this remind you of Russia? And I was like, no, no, there was more ice in our toilet in Russia than what we had here this week. What are you talking about? Because you had to melt it because the water broke and you needed to flush. And so, you know, you just know. Their, their snow was like, or our snow the other day was about, you know, like that. Okay, pastrami on a good New York sandwich is thicker than this. You know that, right? And so that's like a dusting. It's nothing until it freezes in your driveway and you go skiing. But that's nothing. That's nothing. When we had snow, when we first got there, there was so much snow that we would walk into these buildings we moved to Russia in January. Nobody does that. I'm like the one person in the history of the world who moves to Russia in January. And we got there, and there were all these buildings. You would walk into the front door of the building, and you think you're walking just, you know, into the front door, right? And then spring came, and all of that snow melted, and all of that yellow snow melted. Russians like dogs. And, and, and all of that melted, and suddenly, every day, there's like a new step revealed going into our apartment building. I'm like, where do these come from? Next thing I know, there are like five, six feet of steps into these buildings everywhere we went. And the sidewalks, we had never walked on a sidewalk for the first few, what, four months probably of our time there. We thought we were walking on sidewalks. No, the sidewalks were like six feet under. It was insane. What they would do is you go to an open air market to get your groceries. And what they would do at the open air market to move their sleds to their uh, selling booths was they would pour water. It makes sense, okay? You pour water and within a minute, you have this nice slick trail that you can take your sled of groceries to, to your booth in. But later, there's gonna be a Texan try, just trying to buy potatoes, walking down this sidewalk not a sidewalk, it's an ice walk, walking down this thing. And there's 30,000 people crammed into this little open air market, literally 30,000 people on a Saturday crammed in there. And not only are they 30,000 people, but now there are 30,000 people who are three times their normal size because they've got 14 layers and a fur coat on and they're bumping up against each other and you can't even move. If you could get to your elbows, it would be to elbow to elbow. And there's this American in the middle of the pile who doesn't understand how any of this works and does not understand the randomness of someone with a bucket of water in the middle of Russia, 25 degrees below zero, and thinking, let's pour this water on the sidewalk. But that's what they did in the middle of a crowd of people. And here I am, just I just want a potato. Actually, what I really wanted was a Coca-Cola. And I'm trying to find it. And all of a sudden, I'm playing bowling with babushkas all through a Russian market, right? Good grief. This is the memory that got me this morning. As I went down and I landed on all of my pride, blew that right out, right? It's a good thing I'm a preacher because my wallet is really full of air and that acts like those little bubbles inside of a... Of a, of a package, you know, when it falls to the ground. So I didn't actually hurt myself, except for the one arm that is not good because I hurt myself doing something a few years ago and it never has quite healed. And that's what I caught myself with. So that was fun. So yeah, I like ice. I like memories. And the first thing that I normally do whenever I fall is the first thing you normally do when you fall on the ice too, isn't it? You look around and do what? Anybody see that? <laughs> Who saw that? And I actually... 
I actually forgot to do that this morning. I actually, I had fun with it. You know why it was fun? Because it was the first time in like 15 years that I've fallen. When it's like every 15 minutes in the marketplace, that's a pain, isn't it? Not a great ice walker. We all have our weaknesses and we all have our problems. Apparently, this is mine, but I think that I can ski down Texas driveways in the ice and it ain't true. Now, give me a stick shift and a handbrake in a car and then I'm good on ice, but not on feet. So why did I share that with you? We all, we all, have a whole lot of stories of times where we have blown it and where we have failed, where we have a good plan and it doesn't quite work. And that's where we find Paul in Acts 22. Last week we looked at what their plan was. Their plan was to go into Jerusalem and Paul, who was being criticized for not, not, uh, not uh, revering the law of Moses enough. He had cast too much of it aside. He wasn't good enough, strict enough, believing enough a Jewish Christian and people were starting to criticize him and downplay him and question his apostleship and all of this and he comes into town and he wants to reestablish himself and their plan we looked at it last week their plan was if you will go into town and if you will take this vow and maybe maybe it would be even more convincing if you pay for everybody else's vow to put a little skin in the game if you'll do that they'll see how much you still respect the old ways and seeing you show respect for the old ways Maybe you can reestablish some credibility. Maybe you can tamper down some of these tempers and everything will be all right. You'll show them that you're good and, and, and it'll fix the holes of the story that they don't understand. Because I thought they understood it, but they didn't understand it. So he agrees to that. He goes along with it. And I don't know if he thought it was a good idea or not, but, but he did it. And it all blew up in his face. Before they even got through the process that was supposed to be a peacemaking process, what happens is they see Paul and they go, you know what, I saw Paul earlier and he was one of those with one of those heathen Gentiles. And remember, the whole ceremony they were about to go through was for the purpose of washing off the cooties of the Gentiles before they go into the temple to worship God. And that was the whole point. So they go in and they see this guy about to go through this ceremony and they go, there's no way that he really respects us because I saw him with two Gentiles earlier and I think he's got them right here in the middle of the temple. It insulted them. It offended them. And there's nothing worse. I don't think there's anything. There are a lot of mean things in the world, but there is hardly anything meaner than somebody religiously offended I hate to say that, but it's just the truth. When we get righteously offended, we get pretty unrighteous, and that's what happened. So they get upset. They start a riot. They decide they want to kill him. When you get to the point that you think you can kill people in the name of God, you already know that the righteousness problem is not on their side of the equation. It's on yours. But that's what they want to do. Some think that his not being killed was on the level of a miraculous stepping into protection, to protect him by God, because they were that angry and that determined to kill him. Nevertheless, God provides Roman guard to storm in and protect him. And we talked about last week, that's like free protection from God. That's not how we would see that in that moment, I think. We would see it as, great, these people want to kill me, these people want to arrest me, but from God's perspective, it was, here, how about a free security guy? And that's what he got. He goes to the commander. He asks for a chance to speak to the people. And that's where we find him here in Acts 22. Let's read a little bit of this together. It says 21, doesn't it? I don't think I updated that. Verse 1. Then the angel showed, oh, I'm in Revelation. Let's get these, let's get these out. That, that's a whole different story. Okay. In Aramaic. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. And when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I stuttered, I stuttered, I, that would be me. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them for their, 
to their associates in Damascus and then, excuse me, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me, and he was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all of the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately, because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that when I went from one synagogue to another, to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. That's when they got mad. But we'll, we'll keep that for another day, their anger over all of this. Uh, I want to look today at what Paul does as he gets this opportunity, which he asked for to share with them his story. We all have small stories. Some of those are tragic. Some of those are funny. Some of those are meaningful and deep. And some are boring, right? You know, we all have our what I would have done stories. The other day I was listening to somebody tell a story and they were telling this dramatic story about uh, all of these circumstances coming together and, and, and it was going to be awesome and there was this and there was that and, and they're building up and they're building up and they're building up and they went, what might have happened? And I was sitting there going, I was sitting on the edge of my seat. I was excited about this. It was going to be really cool. And then they just went, but, you know, that never happened. Well, that's boring. That was kind of a letdown, right? That happens. Our, our, our overall story is full of these small little things. We put a lot of weight, though, on individual moments. We put a lot of weight on this one time where something big happened. Now, we're going to look at a one-time thing where something big happened with Paul, but we also need to realize the importance of the entire tapestry and not just one part of a story. They looked at one part of his story. It's all they could see and it offended them. They saw Saul. Pharisee of Pharisees, trained guy by Gamaliel, this man who had been on our side. He knew what was right. He knew that these people were not telling the truth. He knew this and he knew that. And they were upset. You've got that crowd. Those who were still angry that he betrayed them. And then there are those who understood his conversion to Christ, but believed that he had Christ all wrong. That he still should have been, while following Christ, still needed to be that stickler of a Pharisee that he had always been. They understood part of his story. They understand all of his story. When we only see one part of a person's story, we can really misunderstand who they are. And that even includes the person in the mirror, doesn't it? We can look in the mirror and we can see about ourselves one part of our story. It can be a positive part, and we're not dealing with some things we need to deal with. It can be the negative that we're ashamed of, and we don't see where God has redeemed us, where God has forgiven us, where God has blessed us. When we focus on one part, we just don't always understand what's going on. And their anger was rooted in seeing just one part of the story. And so Paul wants to help them get the big picture. He says, you know me as Saul. 
You know me as somebody who is, who is this zealous person. And you know me as somebody who persecuted Christians. You know me as somebody who was converted. But do you know why I did any of that? Do you know why this change happened? Because this is not just a story about a guy. It's not a betrayal. It's not me making things up. I mean, this happened, and it's real, and it's bigger than me. And I think that's the part we often miss. Paul's story was so much bigger than him. So is ours. And the people around us, their story is bigger than what we often see. We see their faults. We see their changes. We see this. We see that. We see the things that, that we like. We see the things that offend us. We don't see it all. He says, I'm going to show you. I'm going to pull the curtain back a little bit. I'm going to show you a bigger part of my story. And so he starts opening up about what happened. We have a responsibility as Christians that when we're trying to share the gospel of Christ with other people, when we're trying to help other people understand where we're coming from on why we believe something, you know, we're, we're told in Scripture that we need to be ready to give an account for the things that we believe. We ought to be ready to, to explain, here's why I believe what I believe. But it never needs to be uh, boiled down to, well, I was doing this, and I was researching, and I was looking at, and I think, and I have discerned, and I... It's logical to me, and it makes sense to me. Who's at the center of all that? You know my thing. Pronouns tell the story. I am at the center when I tell the story like that. We need to be able to show why we believe what we believe. To the advantage of the other person, not to the defense of ourselves. I'm going to say that again. We need to be able to explain why we believe what we believe to the encouragement, enlightenment, and, and, and benefit of the person that we're sharing with, not to make ourselves look better. And I think we do that by helping people see the story is God's story, not ours. And that's what Paul does. Don't let people just assume that you believe what you believe because you're a deeply convicted person. No one has been ever, ever been saved by a deeply convicted neighbor. Okay? We're not baptized into our neighbor's convictions. We're baptized into Christ. And that's who it needs to be about. And so when you're sharing with somebody, you know, I just don't believe, da 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 Fine to say that. We need to be able to say that. But it needs to be rooted in because God, whether it's God's word says this, God has convicted me of this, point it back where it belongs. It's his story. And even though, I, I give you an example, I'm not going to get real specific, but there is a particular conviction that I've had most of my life as a Christian. And in the last several years, that particular conviction, uh, conviction has been rather challenged by the Word of God, by the conviction of God, and by the Spirit of God. Now, like I said, I'm not going to get into specifics, because honestly, it's something I'm still wrestling with. It's a good thing, don't be worried about anything. But it just, you know, one of those things where you wrestle with what you understand, what you believe. If it were up to me, if it were about the I, I think, I believe, I conclude, I could have settled this thing in five minutes. I know what it would be if it was up to James, and it would be really easy. It would also be more popular, so that would be fine too. But it's never the question of that, is it? The question is, but what about God? And so I wrestle. I may wrestle with it the rest of my life. I may never tell you what it was. I have no idea. It depends on how the wrestling goes and what God's up to. But it's gonna, if, if I change what I think, or if I modify what I think, it's going to have to be him. Okay? It's going to have to be all his. Saul was that kind of person. And he was very convicted. And God started to shake him very quickly. In a short period of time, God starts to shake him. And he wants them to know, I didn't change because of me. This wasn't because I just thought, you know, I think that would be cooler than what I've been doing. I think that would be easier than what I've been doing. I think that would be more popular because that was one of the... the, the um, Attacks made on Paul quite often. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians, you read about it in 2 Corinthians, you read about it in Galatians. People attacked him. You're just trying to be popular with people. 
Does Paul strike you in this chapter as somebody who's just doing everything to try and be popular with people? It was such a silly assumption. But people make assumptions. Don't lead them there. Don't let your neighbors think that you're a kind person because you're a kind person. Make sure your neighbors know that you're kind because Jesus has changed your story. Because Jesus has come to you and said, I want you to love your neighbor, even the hard one, even the annoying one, even that crazy fool next door who tries to ski down his driveway. That was funny. You know, whoever it is, I want you to love them. I want you to pray for them. The ones who make you the maddest, I want you to pray for the most. You let people understand, listen, I'm not that good, but God is. I just want to be more like Jesus. Point it back to him, but never just leave those assumptions there. And get specific. You have something where you've changed, people are like, no, I noticed you're doing better in this. Don't leave them guessing. Tell them why. Tell them why Jesus convicted you and how. And let them know. Don't, don't let them make assumptions because they might just think you're a good person. Nobody's saved by somebody who's just a good person. Saved when they encounter the risen Lord. In 2 Corinthians, chapter, let's just go ahead over there. Let's just take the time to look at it very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. Paul um, reinforces this point because he's, he's writing to a church where he's had to defend himself just as much as he did that day. In Jerusalem. He says this. Let me go back up to verse 6. Even if I should boast, choose to boast, I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why I say, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For where I am weak, I am strong. Paul lets them see that the most critical moment in his life was not when he said, and I had this aha moment. I was looking through the word of God and I saw it, right? It wasn't like that for Saul. It wasn't because he was wise. In all the wisdom he could muster, he rejected Jesus Christ. In all of his logic, he got it dead wrong. Instead, his story was when I was as wrong as I could be. Jesus. Jesus. He says, and you know what? I've got other weaknesses too. He said, I have some. I'm not even going to tell you what they are. I've got this thorn in the flesh that just bothers me to no end. And I have begged God, please take this away. And God just keeps saying, no. No, I think you'll sing humble yourself in the sight of the Lord better if you just keep it. You just hold on. It's okay. People are going to see me in you more if I leave you with this problem. That's never the answer to prayer any of us want, right? And you know, none of us ever want that, but Paul got it three times, he says. God just said, no, I don't think that's best for the kingdom. People will see Jesus if I can keep Paul out of the way a little bit. When you share your story, let it be Jesus they see. Don't be afraid to open up about, yeah, I needed Jesus. I needed God. I was headed in the wrong direction. I needed him. Not only is that not something to be ashamed of, that's when you sing his praises the best. That's when God receives the greatest glory from what he's done in you. And somebody out there needs you to open up about that because they've been afraid to deal with what they need to deal with. 
And your vulnerability may be the open door they need to say, you know what? Maybe God can do something in me too. Maybe Jesus could fix me too. Maybe he could give me strength too. Because that is the gospel. That is our story. Yes. Saul opens up to this crowd not to set them straight. Not to say, oh, you don't know me. Let me tell you about me. He opens up to this crowd and he shares what is his triumph story and the most embarrassing moment in his life. It has to be. It's like falling on the ice. Busting all your character. He shares his story because somebody will come to Christ because of it. He shares his story so people can see Jesus. Yeah, it reestablishes his credibility with some because people need reality. People don't want a plastic gospel. They don't want a story about how I follow Jesus so I have it all together. They want to know the truth because that's not the truth for any of us, right? Know the truth. I follow Jesus because when I'm with Jesus, I'm a better me. He's the best thing in me. And so we share with them here's where he's made me better. I can't be more grateful for that. And need a plastic testimony, they need Jesus. Paul's story, as he tells it, is really simple. And I put this up there, and I put it all up there at once, because I want you to just take a second and look at that. And you're going to have to listen to me for a second. Uh, just look at this story, and I'm going to go ahead and read through it. It's kind of a summary of what he goes through. He says, I was going headlong in the wrong direction. Huh. Any of us been there, done that? How many times a day do we want to talk about it? You know, how many times today have someone's heading the wrong direction? And then Jesus stopped me in my tracks. I was humbled by a complete loss of control. I was blind for three days, couldn't see a thing. Do we know what that's like? Maybe not physical blindness, but do we know what that's like? It's loss of control, we fear that so bad. That's where Jesus finds us. And a brother, sister in some of your cases, came to me to help me see the way forward. And nice is an important part of the story. We need to be brothers. We need to be sisters who will go to people vulnerable. And nice was scared. He says so. Vulnerable, nervous, but truth telling, pointing people to Jesus. A brother came to me to help me see the way forward. And God showed me a whole new future, a new mission, a new kingdom. And then that brother said, what soul are you waiting for? Get up. Let's be baptized. And Paul says, and so I was. You want to know why I do what I do, Paul says. This is why I do what I do. Not because I'm right. Not because you're wrong. Not because I just got tired of the old ways and want to put it all behind me but because I met somebody. I met somebody named Jesus on the road to Damascus. He changed my life. And I can't go back to the way that I used to be. I can't just pretend that we just keep staying in the same old, same old. Because Jesus changed everything. And I am all in. I bought all in. Can you tell that story about yourself? If you're a Christian, you ought to be able to tell this exact story. Because this, isn't this all our story? Our story is so much the same because the, the, the common denominator, whether good or bad, you can tell what happens in circumstances by looking for common denominators. Learn this as a young man. Just always watch for the common denominators. Uh, sometimes it, it helps you grow. If, if the same problems occur in your life everywhere you go, what's the common denominator? Oh, we don't like that one, do we? I just cut right to the hard one, didn't I? Step on shoes all over the room. If I'm the common denominator, then I'm the one who needs examination, right? Now, it may not be that that's because you're a terrible person. It may be because there are just certain things you're drawn to that are unhealthy and keep recreating a bad circumstance. What are the common denominators? What are the common denominators of grace? I was headed in the wrong direction. Jesus stopped me in my tracks. I was made vulnerable because I lost control of my life. But a brother, a sister 
the Word itself, the Spirit of God, stopped me in my tracks and showed me a way forward. And God called me into a new life. And I got to a point where I said, you know what, God, I am all in. What's the common denominator? We sang about it all morning, didn't we? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Somehow or another, I don't understand it. That made the crowd angry. Isn't that weird? It's so weird. But it doesn't have to be that way. Pride made them angry. Change made them scared, which made them angry. But when you see Jesus, that's not the response, is it? The response when you see Jesus is to do what Saul did that day. And I says, well, what are you waiting for? Let's get up. Why don't you be baptized? Call him on his name. Wash your sins away. What about us? If that's not our story yet, why is it in our story today? And if we've had that story, why isn't it the story we share with passion and zeal and with joy every time we get a chance? When somebody says, you know what? You know, why do you do that? You still go to church? What are you doing that for? Mm, let me tell you. No plastic. Just Jesus. You know what we're going to see? This. Paul couldn't resist it. And he wasn't, it wasn't because he was struck blind that he went into the water. When did he decide? When he could see. He came to Jesus because he finally could see. A risen Lord, a saving grace, and a whole different story. This morning, it may be your time. You may be ready to embrace this, this bigger story of Jesus. Maybe you're stuck at one of those steps, headlong in the wrong direction, a loss of control. You've been wondering, why do I feel that way? Maybe Jesus is convicting you right now and saying, yeah, I got you there because I want to save you. I'm trying to get to you like I got to Saul. And I'll save you like I saved Saul. And my grace is sufficient for you, just as it was for Saul. If you need to give your life to Christ today, we invite you to do so. If you need us to pray with you, if you're a Christian, you've been struggling, you just need a brother to pray with you, then you can come to us too, whether that's right here, you can come down here and we'll pray with you as a family, you can go to the back and we'll pray with you, you can catch us after church, and we'll pray with you. But don't let your story be interrupted by the fact that you've got to go eat. Let your story be interrupted by the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's